I'm going to take you on a trip. I'm going to take you to one of the most amazing places in the world that very few people have been to. I'm going to hopefully make you cry. I want to do that. I want to upset you. I want to start you with sadness. And I want to end this with hope. But I'm going to share something with you that I know a lot about. I've been to the place I'm going to take you all to 12 times in the last nine years. Fewer people go to this place than who go up Everest every year. That's how far away it is. That's how remote it is. It's the hottest place that's inhabited on planet Earth. It gets to be 60 degrees. Very desolate, and people live there. Some of them by choice, many others not by choice. So, who wants to go on the trip? Let's do it together. At the end, you saw a refugee camp operated by the UNHCR. Those people are there in those desperate circumstances in the, this area here, okay? We're in what's called the Afar Triangle. It's the lowest place on continental Africa. It's the beginning of the Great Rift Valley. It is the hottest inhabited place on planet Earth. And we're responsible for helping people there. I'm here to talk about refugees. I'm here to talk about political refugees and environmental refugees. So the Afar people are about 3 million in number, 94% illiterate, 90% still nomadic, just as you see this young man in this picture. They are out roaming in this landscape, eking out an existence. There are very few of them outside of this area in the world. Most of them don't have birth certificates, and yet they're being troubled by the governments that have colonialized their land. We've done some work with them. This is a list of some of the projects we've done. And when we go there once a year for two weeks, sometimes a little longer, we sleep under the stars and we listen to their stories. And their stories are chilling for the most part. Most of them that you've seen and will hear about today have come from Eritrea. So this is really a case study. The topic is changing wind that I'm presenting to you. And it's a topic about what we're facing in the world now caused by political unrest, religious intolerance, tribalism, ethnic cleansing, genocide, but also by what we're doing to the world that we inhabit as we make it more difficult for others because of climate change. We are compliant with the UN Millennial Goals. This is a list of them. I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is what I care about. This is what I want to share with you. This is the trip I want to take you on. This is the place that we need to think about. It's not in our backyard. It's not even on our continent. It's in a place very, very far from here. But like you throw a stone in a pond and it has ripples, what's going on there is having a ripple effect all over the world. So there are right now about 43 million refugees who the UN describes as being persecuted by one of five things, religious intolerance, political opinions, their ethnicity, their membership in a particular social group, and so forth. Those are the refugees that the UN is tasked with its mandate, the UNHCR, to protect. On top of those 43 million, there are about another 50 or 60 million estimates by academics of what's called environmental refugees. People are being displaced by climate change, by rising ocean levels, by soil erosion, by deforestation and degradation. Why do these things happen? And what effect are they having? Some of these ex same experts who estimate this population of about 50 million say by the year 20, 2050, that population will be 200 million. What is this going to do? It's causing stress on resources, it will result in conflict, competition for fewer and fewer resources, and we need to think about what we're going to do. And what is the world's responsibility to protect, to house, to educate, to provide health care, to provide food, sanctuary, protection, freedom? What is the world's responsibility? Well, in the case of Syria, we, we have seen and continue to see that the world has done very little about it. 
It's caused massive problems in the neighboring countries, and Canada rose up and has accepted 35,000 such refugees from Syria. Maybe they're, they came from an unlucky background, and maybe now they have some hope. But these people really have none. They don't have birth certificates. Without birth certificates, they're not going to get passports. So they're really on the outer limit. They're out there on the edge of our stratosphere in what, what they're entitled to and what they're receiving. I've been to that very place. I might have been the one who took that picture. It is a UNHCR refugee camp. It is the bleakest thing I've seen in my life. I've lived, traveled, and worked in 50 countries, and I've not seen something as bleak and as desperate as this. But what I want to introduce you to also is the concept of hope. These people, although they have very little, are the most beautiful, caring, sharing people you would ever want to meet. They're indigenous, they're aboriginal. That means they share their resources. And the welcome mat is there for us when we go. It's incredible. From so little, they give so much. So that's part of the story. The part of the story is that calf who almost died out there in the desert at the beginning of that video, got up and had the courage to keep going. These are environmental refugees. I was there in July. We took that photograph inside this stone house, really on the edge of planet Earth. It was 54 degrees. These people had nothing. They had fled from a combina combination of drought in the Horn of Africa, in this piece, place of Ethiopia. They have had the worst drought in the last 50 years. Drought is being caused, as you know, by global warming in El Nino. We talked with them. We listened to them. They fled also a volcano that had happened across the border in Eritrea. The volcanoes, of course, had a lot of sulfur to it. The sulfur was spread, and it destroyed what little hope they had for any crops at all. So a combined effect of the volcano and the drought has caused them to move in large numbers to places they don't belong, places they don't want to be in, and to put pressure on the local community, which can barely afford to look after them. So what is the world's obligation? What's the UN's obligation and Canada's obligation to contribute to the UN so the UN can fulfill its mandate? Think about it. The tribe gave me an honorary title. You saw it on the video, you heard it in the introduction. The name is Wadi, and it translates from the Afar language to the English word savior. It's a tough one, it's hard. It's hard to be a savior for anybody, for one person, let alone three million. I try every day to do that, and I want you to think about what you can do to do that as well. There's a rising xenophobia in the world. We've seen it in Europe. We see it in the country just south of us, with what's happened in the election just recently. It's troublesome. Nationalism is, and patriotism on the extreme end is very troublesome. I need you to get the word out. We're all part of this planet Earth. We need to share. We're born here to love. We only learn to hate. Whether, you, whether we help through immigration or deploying aid, it's important to stay connected as people. Who wants, in this room and beyond it, who wants to come with me, to join me, to be part of this journey to rescue and save? Who's going to rewrite history? You saw Lucy in the video. 42 years ago today, Lucy was discovered by an American paleontologist. Lucy was the first upright walking hominin. About that big, okay? If you know Lucy, if you don't know Lucy, look her up, okay? She's our grandmother, and Artie is our great-grandmother. Who wants to be the next Wadi? 